Hi, I'm Tony Nichols, and welcome to Chamber Chat. Hi, welcome to Chamber Chat, a program put together by the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce for the sole purpose of keeping you informed on what's going on in your community and in your chamber. Joining us today is Kevin Wright, the Wacomico County Fire Marshal, and we had to invite Kevin in because we understand that Chamber Chat is getting so hot in the community wow, yeah. that we may need some containment. So, uh, so Kevin, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having Hope me. Hope you bring your expertise with yeah, you. So, yeah, yeah. Because we may need cool it. things off a little bit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Let, well, let's start out with everyone has heard uh, uh, about the fire marshal, whether it's good or bad. Sure. Can yeah. you start with a day in the life of Kevin Wright, the Wacomico County Fire Marshal? Sure, sure. We are... Um, it's Maybe sometimes easier to explain what we don't do. The state fire marshals have a president in the area. They handle all of the fire investigations, explosive investigations, okay, yeah. where I'm on the this side of the fire, so to speak, mm -hmm. before prevention, code enforcement. Um, our job is sort of two halves. It's the commercial construction that you see, permitting and inspections. If this building was built today, I'd be involved from plan review mm -hmm. uh, to the final CO was issued to occupy the building. But the other half where they don't really see us a lot is um, the maintenance type stuff, uh, going out to festivals, making sure exits aren't blocked, nightclubs, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, nightclubs, um, hanging out with the police, doing bar checks, making sure they're not over-occupied uh, in wee hours of the morning. Um, so I never, I never would have thought, let me, yeah. I never would have thought to, to, that I would, I, would, I would expect to see the police department there, but yeah. I, would, I would have never thought that there might be a presence every now and then from the fire, uh, fire, uh, fire marshal. And it mostly has to do with uh, ca maximum capacity. Sure. You know, if yeah. you own the bar or restaurant, your capacity would be 150, and it's your job to make sure it stays there. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, I have to be the bad guy and go in and you need to get some folks out of here. Uh, you're a little over-occupied and, and exits are, are locked or blocked or whatever, something like that. And then retail inspections is a good thing. You know, in the holidays, you know, right. bus busy in stores, making sure that people have the last thing on their mind is, are my exits cleared? That's right. And so it takes people like me to come in and say, hey, move stuff out of the way. You never know when exits will be used. So uh, it's not a normal same thing every day type of job is the unexpected. I could get a phone call probably while I'm sitting here talking to you. Mm -hmm. I need you to stop by here and take a look at this. Right. And I'll go do it. So often my, my day time or my, uh, my calendar on my phone is very flexible. It has, <laughs> to, be, has to be very fluid. <laughs> fluid, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that was the word yeah. I was going to use, yeah. And very fluid to adjust to the many things because it, we respond to complaints in the middle of the night. You know, uh, or maybe a fire department responds to a, a place that's got a sprinkler system in it and they have to take it out of service. Mm -hmm. So I have to come up and do the code stuff. Those guys sure. handle all, you know, the typical first responder issues where it's my job to handle the, the code side and make sure things are appropriate. Well, that was a very broad stroke and there's a lot of things in there, but yeah. in every interaction, you're interacting with the community, whether it sure. be the business community or whether the residential community. And I know um, sometimes you're the hero. Yeah. And probably sometimes you're the guy that the villain. The yeah. villain. Yeah, yeah. yeah a good yeah, word, sure. the villain. Yeah. yeah. So how, how is that relationship with the community? It's something that when I took over the office uh, three years ago, that was very important to me, having spent time in the private sector and knowing what the image that fire marshals, fire inspectors have mm -hmm. is sort of this block of this wall that you have to get through. Right. We walk in the door, okay, what are you, what's wrong now? How much money are you going to cost me? Right. It was really important to me to, to have that paradigm shift where assumptions were flipped and we're not, we're here to come alongside. Um, yeah, there's going to be times where I have to make you spend money because you haven't maintained something properly, mm -hmm. but it's very important to, to make sure I, I don't get lumped in with the folks at the DMV. You know what I mean? Or the, you know, it's just kind of, I, I'm, I'm there to help you. I have sold and suggested more code requirements than I've been forced. Gotcha. You know what I mean? And so it's not about, I show up and you've got to do these things and call me when it's fixed and I leave and just kind of throw the code book at people. Mm -hmm. um, it's just more of a suggestive, and you know, give the intent of why the code says that. And most of the time, I don't even have to bark, let alone bite when it comes to code enforcement, because I can, they sort of see where I'm at. Okay, right. yeah, I get it. Makes sense, that's fair. I, you got a job to do, and I understand. And, and I think in general, people want to do the right thing. They want to be safe and make sure the yeah. people or the families are safe. And, it, and sometimes, 
it's not, the last thing on their mind is whether or not they've got exits blocked or their fire alarms or fire sprinklers have been tested like they should be. So right. it takes sort of that fresh eyes to walk into a building and look for the, those type of things, right. you know. So the, that's a unique approach um, rather than saying I have a job to do yeah. and I'm going to do that job sure. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you safe whether you want to be safe or not, yeah. Yeah. Um, to having that creative approach that you're, you're yeah. there to assist yeah. and to inform. So is, is there a big, is there a master plan? Is there a vision that, I mean, somewhere you want to get to that, that yeah. maybe we aren't there yet? It, yeah, and that's, I think the end goal is, and um, I shared yesterday when I spoke to the chamber at their Lunch and Learn that I have a $6 million man principle. The show that was in the 70s. Oh, yeah. And we can make him build, build him faster, <laughs> bigger, stronger. And that principle is essentially there's always a better way. Um, and, you know, we can do it better. Even it, that what's good, we can make it better. And that's just something that's ingrained in my thought process from the way we deal with people, the way we deal with the government. Um, but just to get to the point where they don't see us as a hurdle, a stumbling block, as just this negative, the DMV type thing that they've right. got to deal with where it's, it's not unpleasant to deal with us. You know, Yeah, there are certain black and white issues that I will not budge on. Mm -hmm. But let me explain some of those better. And I have just have found the response from the development community specifically, mm -hmm. architects, contractors, engineers, sure. uh, property managers and owners where in the past three years they, are, the, they will seek me out where before I had to go chase them down. Gotcha. And uh, so that's sort of the end goal was just to be a partner, another cog in the wheel in the development process mm -hmm. in the county and to sort of shift that because the, the bad image of fire marshals is sort of a nationwide thing. We're just the, the guys that come in and bully you around, and, and I just wasn't happy with that. And so that's kind of where we're going. All right, I'm gonna throw you a softball. Okay. Um, why is fire code enforcement good? I mean, I mean, and to get into a little bit of how you enforce it and yeah. how people view it. Um, it's the, probably the best way to describe that is what happens when fire code enforcement doesn't exist. Uh, it's my job to plan for the worst and hope for the best to walk into a place like this studio and, and look at things that work, what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm not out there, our office is not out there with a constant presence, restaurants, nightclubs, apartment complexes, hotels, uh, making sure that all these codes are compliant. The devastating effect on the community, I referred yesterday to the station nightclub fire that happened up in Rhode Island 11 years ago, where a business closes down, uh, people at this and this fire died, um, lawsuits out the wazoo, mm -hmm. and there were some fire code enforcement issues on the front of that. Um, may not have prevented the fire, but it may have prevented the catastrophe side oh, of it. So okay. um, it's trying to prevent, we don't want to be a news story. You know, I, I check the papers, the blogs, whatever, every morning to say what happened last night. Mm -hmm. What could I have done to prevent that? If it you know when it relates to fire code stuff. Right. So, uh, talking about new uh, fire codes, uh, I think there are some new sprinkler sprinkler uh, regulations sure. that are yeah. coming into play. Yeah, that's a that's a hot topic. Um, hot you know, topic. Pun it, intended. Yeah, yes, pun very much <laughs> intended. Yeah, uh, my my job when it comes to let me back up. Uh, the state of Maryland, uh, you know, made it a mandate that all local jurisdictions like Wacomico, Salisbury, Fruitland, and Delmar have to adopt the current residential building code and in that code is the requirement to install residential sprinklers and so there are debates back and forth yay or nay of the worth of them and I guess my job is because I, I work for administration the previous exec the new exec have made no secret that they don't really support them so I can't speak against that but my job is to educate mm -hmm. and tell you the benefits of and that it's coming you know so January 1st this past year the state enacted the latest code cycle, 2015 version of the residential building code. And that is the requirement for residential sprinklers. And so the local jurisdictions have six, month, six months to adopt that. So uh, in a perfect world, come July 1st, statewide, um, every house that's built will be fully sprinklered. And, and there are lots of pauses for that. Um, sure. My job really isn't to convince you why you need them, but to just talk about, uh, I'm the educator and then I have to enforce dealing with sprinkler contractors when they put it in. So it'll be a level playing field across the state. Maryland is on the forefront of any kind of uh, fire code enforcement just because you've got the University of Maryland that's got a fire protection engineering program. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're kind of one of the three or four states nationwide that is r really on the cutting edge of new requirements and new standards. You know? Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more uh, about that in the oh, coming yeah. weeks and yeah. months. Sure. But, um, yeah. 
Kevin, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, um, keep your eye on keep your eye on us because we are hot. All right. And, I'll uh, make sure I send so, some folks over here. All right. Yeah. Kevin Wright, thanks for joining. All right, thank you. Yeah. We'd like to give you the opportunity now to take a look at the upcoming events with the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to Chamber Chat right here on Pack 14. Joining us now is Beth Olson. And Beth is with SSACC. Now we all know what SACC stands for, the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. So tell us what SSACC stands for. It stands for the Salisbury Substance Abuse Community Center. Gotcha. Well, thank you for joining us today on Chamber <laughs> Chat. Um, now tell us what the Salisbury uh, Substance Abuse Center is about. Um, the Salisbury Substance Abuse Community Center is a small nonprofit that provides space for 12-step meetings. What that means is people who are in the recovery process from drug and alcohol addiction come to these 12-step meetings to learn how to live without drugs or alcohol. Okay, gotcha. I would imagine that that is a very popular, uh, unfortunately, a very popular program that many people participate in. Yes. A thousand times a week, someone crosses our threshold to attend a meeting. A thousand times a week? Yeah, roughly 50,000 times a year. I can't say it's 50,000 people because someone right. might go to sure. a meeting every day, they might go to two. That's but a, a thousand, staggering statistic. It is. But what's more staggering is that 10% of any area, the population of any area, is addicted to some sort of substance or behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's an epidemic. That's probably a little uh, a little known fact um, by most people in Wicomico County and the surrounding areas. How long have you guys been around? When were you, when were you founded? It was an idea in 1987. And what happened in 1987 was a number of recovering people came together to create what was then called the 12 Steps Club. Okay. Um, the SAC Center actually opened its doors in 1991, and we've been around for the last 24 years. This is our third location. Wow. Um, so y you talked earlier about uh, a 12-step process, 12-step program. You have a 12-step fellowship, I understand? They're called fellowships, okay. and there are quite a few of them. The original 12-step fellowship was Alcoholics Anonymous, All right. and that was started in 1939. Mm -hmm. About 20 years later, Narcotics Anonymous was started okay. with the blessing and help of Alcoholics Anonymous. The people addicted to drugs felt like they had some issues that weren't being addressed in AA, right. so they wanted NA. Mm -hmm. Since then, there have been tons of programs that have been um, grandchildren of Alcoholics sure. Anonymous, and there's Overeaters Anonymous, there's Gamblers Anonymous, gotcha. there's Chemical Dependency Anonymous, there's a there's a lot. How many do you guys run in your program? We have 35 meetings a week. Wow. And we don't run those. Each group runs itself. Has its own facilitator. Has yeah. its, yes. Mm -hmm. And we provide the space and the staff to keep the building open and available for the recovery Well, process. as many people as you're saying cross that threshold a week. Mm -hmm. How does how does somebody join, or do you join, or do you just show up? How do you how do you get involved? You show if, up. If you okay, you, you show, show up. up. Okay. Um, there are no dues or fees. There are no applications, registrations. It's Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. What goes on in that room is private and nobody else's like business. Vegas. <laughs> um, a little bit better than Vegas. Right, I, I would agree. Same, okay. same concept though. What, what happens there stays there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what are the differences, let me ask you if I could, what are the, because it seems like there could be a very big redundancy if there are multiple 12-step programs. What are the differences, if you could speak to that, in, in um, one versus the other? Well, the difference is whatever the addiction is. It okay. could be a behavior. It could be a substance. 
And there's a really big difference between Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous because alcohol is legal. Right. You know, and so that creates a division in the kinds of issues that people need to deal with. Mm -hmm. And in a 12-step meeting, what you learn to do is how to live without benefit of drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so Gamblers Anonymous would address gambling addiction. Gotcha. And I have a suspicion that the more legal gambling becomes, the more problem gamblers we will see. Uh, I would agree with that. You know, Overeaters Anonymous addresses food as an addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, and with the obesity problem in this country, that fellowship will grow. We don't have an Overeaters Anonymous chapter at SAC Center, but I suspect we will have one soon. Um, the um, Chemical Dependence Anonymous is a, is a fellowship that doesn't really care whether it was an alcohol or a drug or whatever it was, mm -hmm. you know, just being there. And they all use the same 12 steps. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot if I can. Okay. If you, you talk about how prevalent it is, and I think everyone uh, listening and watching will, will agree, do you have any statistics that you could share in terms of the prevalence of drug and alcohol abuse or chemical dependency or how it breaks kind of breaks out? Sure. Yes. Um, no. Okay. I don't. Okay. I wish I did. The the idea of uh, just in what we can see in the community is. It's rampant. Yes, especially the heroin problem. Well, uh, you, you, you stole my thunder. The, uh, I was going to ask uh, how much of what you're seeing is, is, has direct ties to the heroin, heroin issue that we have in the area. Um, I can simply say there are twice as many narcotics, narcotics Anonymous meetings at the SAC Center as there are alcohol and, wow. Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sorry I can't talk this morning. Yeah. Um, have you heard me talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that bears witness right. to the prevalence of the problem. Mm -hmm. the, um, and one of the things about that is so many people get caught because of pain management. And it's really tragic when those people who are simply doing what the doctor said, you know, for whatever reason, cross that threshold and it becomes an addiction. It's really sad, and it tears families and communities apart. Sure, it does. Um, if there are, if there's no cost to the participants, the people that walk across that threshold, how do you get funding? Where's your funding come from? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the United Way is our biggest financial mm -hmm. supporter, and the Community Foundation is right behind them. And what they fund are specific needs that we have. Okay. They um, recently gave us a grant to buy computers. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have some corporate sponsors. We've worked very hard in this last year to get some corporate sponsors. Uh, Purdue, Hazel Foundation, Henson Foundation, For Sure Federal are among our, and PRMC are among our mm -hmm. corporate supporters. We have individual donors. We do a mail campaign twice a year. And then the people who actually use the facility, we, they pass the basket and we get a percentage of that as rent. That only covers about 10% of the cost of doing business. Wow. So if there were, uh, what are things that on a on a day-to-day -day basis, the blocking and tackling just to keep the doors open, what are things that the SAC Center might need? Um, we need chairs. Chairs, okay. I mean, that's good. That's, <laughs> we need chairs. Be specific that way. Um, 50,000 times a year, somebody's sitting in a chair. Right. They, <laughs> I don't think they're built for that kind of use <laughs> and abuse. Um, we'd love to have the building painted. We would. We need, we always need money. Mm -hmm. You know, utilities are expensive and rent is expensive mm -hmm. for as many square feet as we have. But what we really need is to have people shift their attitude mm -hmm. towards recovering people. You know, addicts don't choose to be addicts. Mm -hmm. And when they try to get clean and sober, there's a, a learning curve to living like a clean and sober person and I would love to see more tolerance of that. Do you have a website or something that you we could give do. us to, that people could uh, log in and, and check that out and see how, how they could give? Yes, uh, the website is ssacc.org and there is a pledge form and a donation form on the website and we would love to hear from you. Beth Olson, we're glad we heard from you today.
Thank you. Thanks for thank, having me. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give you another opportunity now to take a look at the upcoming events with the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to Chamber Chat right here on Pack 14. Joining us now is uh, no stranger to the program now. I guess you're a veteran of, of uh, Chamber Chat now. Jackie Gass with Eastern Shore Business Leadership Network. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. You're here to talk about um, an event that's gaining momentum over the last couple of years in the area. Tell us what that is. It's Ability Awareness Day, formerly known as the Able to Work Community Event at the Zoo. And we, uh, it's actually, we're in our sixth year. Yes. So that's uh -huh. pretty cool. It's, it's and uh, moment, yeah. yeah, so we, um, uh, it's a, an awareness event mm -hmm. to raise awareness that people with disabilities can and want to work and give back to their community. Very good. Now, this is the sixth year. You've actually, in the last couple of years, morphed just a little bit. And you've partnered with uh, a sister event, I'll call it. Um, and, and really have come together to form a pretty cool event where you're um, creating awareness on two fronts. Yes, yes, and that's exciting because even though the ESBLN, Eastern Shore Business Leadership Network, is about um, uh, you know helping people um, become employed, uh -huh. um, it's one of my personal pet peeves, <laughs> so it fits great for me, about litter okay. and anti-litter campaign, really. So Stash Your Trash is, came from the beautification uh, committee at the Salisbury Chamber, which the ESBLN is part of. Uh -huh. And um, so it, it was a perfect match because they always wanted to do a cleanup in the spring, and we always have done our cleanup in the spring, and because they're both chamber events, right. we thought, well, why don't we just make the awareness even larger and combine efforts? So yes, we had a good group. Um, they, uh, we both work, we work primarily at the zoo, mm -hmm. and then the uh, chamber uh, reaches out to the city, citywide in sure. uh, various areas in the city, and then we end up at the zoo and have lunch and a little ceremony. And Well, I want to go back fun. to Ability Awareness Day. Talk a little more about what the goal of that is. I know you spoke briefly about, you know, helping to, and I hate to use the words, but prove once again mm -hmm. that, you know, people that may have a disability can function fine in the workplace in, in many different capacities. But is, is that really the goal once again to just one more time, <laughs> here, here it is, and, and these people are just as viable as anyone else as far as candidates are concerned. I appreciate you saying it that way, and you just said it. Uh -huh. So, yes, that's what we want. It's, a, it's really, um, uh, it is a business, the Eastern Shore Business Leadership Network is a business-to-business -business network. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we have employers sponsor teams, and they come out, and they um, work side by side with people, people first, and people with disabilities, um, and then uh, they kind of, there's a lot of stigma attached with mm -hmm. the word disability, sure. so, you know, they're just people. Everybody's right. just people. We right. all have our different disabilities, mm -hmm. but they're just people and they want to work. And so what we're trying to do is, is get rid of that stigma a little bit. Mm -hmm. So our, some of the folks who come out look a little different, walk a little different, act a little different, but boy, they are hard workers. <laughs> all of those <laughs> things could be said about me. <laughs> and they could be said about me. Because we all, honestly, that's absolutely that's true. true. People without different disabilities, act a little different, walk a little different, look a little different. And uh, some of us talk a little different. <laughs> yes, we <and> do. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Oh, oh, me too. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so over the years, are there any things um, that you can point to as specific outcomes of Ability Awareness Day that you would say, you see, this is what we told you? Well, yes, actually, first and foremost, um, we do see that. We get the verbal um, feedback the day of the okay. event. So we all finish our cleanup. Um, it's really mulching, um, raking, mm -hmm. a lot of, um, you know, beautifying the zoo really for Earth Day. But, um, and we all come back 
and have lunch together and everybody's talking, everybody's happy and, and they do say, boy, this particular person really worked really hard mm -hmm. and this, um, and we had um, one year where one of the companies said, um, you know, I need, uh, they did a really good job with this landscaping. I'm gonna give them a call wow. and see if we can uh, have them come out and uh, clean up our uh, corporate you know, um, mm -hmm. surroundings, uh, mm -hmm. facility, you know, and do some, some of that work for us. We've also uh, had some placements come from it, which That's is pretty fantastic. good, which is pretty cool. But we're gonna be a little more formalized this year. We're gonna have a survey afterwards, mm -hmm. which we have done in the past, but haven't been consistent, so we're gonna, we're gonna really hit that hard this year. So you have teams that go out, mm -hmm. is, is that correct? And in these teams, the, what's the chemical makeup of these teams? Well, they're preformed teams, okay. so the public can't just sign up for the zoo right. event. It is okay. a sponsored event, and you have to be invited to um, be a part of that. Mm -hmm. But we want everyone to come out and cheer us on and help us and, right. Right. and uh, you know, uh, be aware of what we're doing. But um, the makeup of the teams is uh, employers, about four or five um, employer volunteers. Okay. Uh, work with four or five uh, people with disabilities, which can be from an agency, can be from the school system. Um, we've had a lot of students come out in the past. Uh, we have, um, and they and they work side by side, okay. so that they're integrated teams, you might say. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, people don't know who have the disabilities. It's wow. it, there's That's a lot cool. of hidden disabilities, and we don't tell them. Mm -hmm. So. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Do, do you have as many teams as you need or want, or do you see it getting bigger or turning into a, a week rather than a day? I mean, how, what we does do, that look like? We do the morning. Uh, it's always a morning, Saturday mm -hmm. morning, which is April 11th. Um, and it's been um, at capacity every single year. Really? This That's year, fantastic. it is. And they're volunteers. Nobody's being paid mm -hmm. to come out there. Mm -hmm. So it's really awesome. And of course, the zoo is a great place. Yeah, it really is a great place. Yeah, and what's really neat this year, um, we they have increased the number of people that we're able to bring out. Okay. So we're going to have a record number this year. I know it. So we're excited about that. Wow. And so there will be more teams, even? Or more just, teams. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're bringing, um, we uh, are going to bring a few more new teams so in. So the event in and of itself is growing not just the the awareness of it but the event in and of itself is growing as well yes yep so that's pretty cool all pretty signs neat. of a healthy event oh definitely yeah it's fun well listen where can we find out more information um maybe for next year because it sounds like um it, it's popular enough where you can't get in this year or if, or, if, or if you do have some positions available this year where can we find out the information um the uh you can call the chamber mm -hmm. at um the, the chamber website mm -hmm. will be posted after sure. this and also it's on the ESBLN website ESBLN.org on the events page you'll get more information there and you'll see some past photos uh, but this year uh, and you can sign up you people are welcome to sign up for the um, the stash your trash mm -hmm. cleanup so if mm -hmm. we had and you can also um, ask us about the zoo event if you're an employer or when you're interested in coming out and helping we'll st we're still taking more employer sponsorships which includes the sponsorship for the folks with disabilities right. um, so we're still in the registration phase for that right now and if we have too many if we, we hit capacity then we'll still keep you we right. don't turn volunteers <laughs> away <laughs> so uh, we'll just we're working together with stash your trash um, and again it's a whole chamber event and so yes uh, please um, give us a call and we'll get you uh, out working that day and it's just so much fun it, the reason it's so great and and successful mm -hmm. I mean right. is because people want to come back every year because they just say it's such I had somebody say yesterday it's a feel-good event Right. Awesome. Well, Jackie Gass, we certainly appreciate what you do for the community, what you do for uh, the, the work that you do to try to find work for people that, that might need help. So that's um, very much appreciated. Thanks for coming on Chamber Chat and telling us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And just one last message. Employers, just open up those doors and, and think about people with disabilities as a, as a recruitment uh, pool, of label, pay, pool, pool of labor for you. Very Thank good. you so much. Well, I can't think of a better way to end this session of Chamber Chat. Um, as always, if you've missed any portion of this program or 
previous programs, you can visit PAC-14's website and utilize their on-demand feature, or you can visit the Chamber website as well. That's all the time we have for this edition of Chamber Chat. My name's Tony Nichols, encouraging you to make a difference. Thank you.